five minutes in, so I think we will uh, make a start. We're at about 200 uh, participants, so um, thank you everyone for joining us for this session of, uh, for this Regen webinar, the next in, if you like, Regen's kind of regular series of, of webinars, and this is actually the first of a, of a new sort of um, series which we're doing through in November, the Green Recovery Series. Um, uh, focusing in obviously on the kind of uh, sort of key uh, issue for for this for this agenda at the moment, which is the kind of building back better, the job opportunities, the bringing together net zero and the climate emergency with recovery from the pandemic, uh, with investing in uh, making the recovery investment uh, green. Uh, so, you know, obviously a big theme, and we saw that yesterday with the uh, 10 point plan from the Prime Minister. Um, so, this is our sort of contribution, if you like, to what sometimes uh, I've, I've heard referred to as net zero November. So, um, hopefully, we're going to be some more towards the end, the rest of the year, some more important announcements, some of which we'll perhaps be discussing a little bit more today. Um, now, this session is focused on homes, uh, greening our homes, making our homes fit for the future. Inevitably, I think we'll, we'll look a little bit broader into the context of decarbonizing uh, buildings, more generally the built environment. Um, and I could argue that this is the biggest challenge, certainly right up there in terms of you know, tackling the climate em emergency. When you well, we've done a lot of work with um, utilities, local authorities, local government, devolved governments, looking at the kind of pathway to net zero. And, you know, broadly speaking, I don't, when we look at the power sector, I think we can all see the, the direction we're going in. And we're all pretty confident now about the, the technology of renewables, of storage, of decentralization. We saw, we saw uh, yesterday the announcement about bringing forward the ban on uh, internal combustion engine cars um, and uh, for those of us who've driven electric vehicles I think you know th that's a great technology it's I haven't met anyone yet who drives an EV who would ever go back uh, to a petrol car so you know we, we can see the path on transport we can see the path in, uh, in, in power but much you know when you when you think about decarbonizing our homes was it 28 million gas boilers or some something you know a huge challenge and a challenge that affects everyone it's very you know very uh, very personal it's about your about your home it's about how efficient it is and what heats it and it's about changing uh, something you've got very used to and um, for ages and, it, and indeed i think a lot of surveys suggest that people most people aren't even really aware or have never really thought about the fact that their gas boiler is a you know, is high carbon uh, is part of their carbon footprint. Uh, so this is this is re really the, the the big challenge, the one that we haven't uh, we haven't fixed. Um, and as I've already referred to uh, before this session, we thought we um, it'd be good to have some government policy announcements to tee us up. So we um, you know got in touch with uh, Boris obviously and asked him if he could just make make something up, put it out, and uh, he very kindly did that in launching his. 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution yesterday. Um, I'm just, I have it in front of me on my other screen and there's a, a page and a half here on, on greener buildings. Um, so uh, lo lots of, of policy uh, and announcements in that key part of, of the 10 point plan. Um, and that's really set us up nicely, I think for the, for the discussion uh, today. There is some regen analysis of the 10 point uh, plan on our website and indeed uh, we've uh, already, we're across all media types, we've already done the podcast uh, on our views of the 10 point plan. Um, so if that's your, your favourite uh, way of consuming it, so yeah if you want to us doing the washing up or something you can listen to us talking about the 10 point plan. Um, so as I said, Boris has teed us up nicely. Uh, the agenda today, which um, uh, I imagine Hannah will magically bring up as when I say that, that's our producer. Uh, if, uh, if not, I'll be uh, talking you <laughs> through it. Um, it's pretty simple, really. We, we are going to um, uh, 
uh, we're going to start with an interview with Adrian from Bayes, who has the uh, job of writing the homes and building strategy. Um, and uh, yes, that when we were doing that podcast about the 10 point plan, I, I described that as the most important government policy announcement in this space. So um, no pressure there for, for Adrian. Nice, nice, easy job for her. So we're going to she's going to give us a little bit of a presentation on what will the big issues for that that um, for that strategy and her, her worry list. Um, so uh, that'd be fascinating. Um, um, after that, we're going to open up and, and have a, a panel chat and we've got some great speakers um, and, and experience from a range of different backgrounds to kind of explore these issues in a bit more detail. Uh, so that is the uh, running order agenda. Um, so I think at this point, let's uh, invite Adrian to come back on. Hi, I think I've pulled on my video in plain unattractive pose. <laughs> That's annoying. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop my video and start it again. See if that makes Perfect. a difference. It's all about. Oh yeah. Lovely. Hi. Excellent. You're all right, Adrian. Hi everyone. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so as Marilyn said, my name is Adrian Briggs. Um, I work at Bayes and I'm head of long-term heat transformation um, in the heat and buildings strategy team. And my team has got the, the fun task of doing the drafting and the publication for the heat and building strategy, which we hope will follow hot on the heels of the energy white paper, which we expect later this year. Um, so if I what I'd like to do is just speak briefly through some slides, uh, and then I think Merlin's going to ask uh, some patient questions. Um, so if I, uh, so just in terms of this opening slide, what we want to get across in the heat and building strategy is that it is, it is a whole building, whole system approach that we're talking about here. And that's one of the reasons why we're talking about energy efficiency and heat transformation together. It's really important that those two, two components sit together in the same document. So Hannah, would you be able to move on to the next slide, please? Great, thank you. Um, so in terms of the, the content of the, the kind of things that we're going to be talking about in the heat and building strategy, the way that I think about it is there are really two there were really two key pillars of action in the 20 in the early 20s and that is we really want to capitalize on low regrets action so boosting energy efficiency is low regrets in any scenario um and developing low carbon heating markets so developing the heat network market developing the heat pump market and obviously as well investing in research and innovation for hydrogen um we also talk about the principles that we're going to set out that cover the, the transformation. And th some of those principles are things that will kick off now. So things like we will target the worst first. Uh, so we're gonna target the, the, the lowest CPC ratings first because they give off the most emissions. Um, we set out that we, we're going to take a whole systems approach. So we really want to avoid kind of patchwork planning. So stuff happening in little isolated pockets. As I mentioned, we really want to grow markets, and that's some really important groundwork that we are going to do in this at the start of this decade. Um, investing in R and D, and I met, I've already mentioned hydrogen, but that you know there's research and development going on across all different heat scenarios, across all different energy energy efficiency um, technologies, and of course smart technologies as well. Um, and also that we want to target social housing and fuel poor first. Those are the people who are the least able to pay so we need to make sure that they are supported both in the early stages and when we move to a mass transition later on uh, further down the line at the start of the next decade. Um, we talk about the opportunities that are going to be created and obviously um, uh, the Prime Minister mentioned that in his 10 point plan yesterday about the, the kind of 200,000 to 300,000 new jobs that we were expecting to be created as a consequence of these improvements in homes and buildings. Um, we talk about technologies and I should say, uh, you know, in terms of where we were in 2018, which was really a really detailed, the publication that we released in 2018, which was a really detailed interrogation of the pros and cons of different, different technologies. 
we want to we do set out what the technologies are here but what we don't want to do is wax lyrical about how they work and the advantages and disadvantages because we've we've been there already so this is really about moving the conversation on and we group those technologies into energy efficient technologies low carbon heating technologies and flexible technologies we talk about the buildings landscape and how complex it is and the there's obviously an aggregated picture and the you know the line that we take is that we want to um improve the epc rating of all buildings where where it's practical um but you know just to give you a, a kind of this the idea of the scale of that problem you're talking about social housing you're talking about public sector buildings you're talking about large non-domestic buildings you know regular houses you're talking about smaller non-domestic buildings so the building landscape is very complex and it's important that we reference that and we try and unpick it a little bit because the policies that work in one building will not be the same as the policies that work in another and that's that flexibility and optionality is really important and then the final thing that the strategy does is talks about the the, the comprehensive policy landscape for the 2020s um, and some of the kind of principles that we adhere to in that policy package so the idea that we are going to use natural trigger points so that will be natural trigger points in a building life cycle um, as well as natural trigger points in terms of uh, the kind of owner occupancy or whether it's you know swapping rental hands things like that uh, we talk about leading by example so the need to uh, decarbonize a public sector first and that will help in two ways number one is it will lead the way but number two is it will really help build supply chains and build the workforce which is obviously really important um, and we want to give really clear market signals in the heating building strategy so that we'll give industry the the clarity that they need to be able to invest in their in their pipelines going forward um, and the final thing is you know we know that the heat and building strategy is not going to solve all of the problems uh it's a it's a big it's a big journey that we're about to embark on and we haven't got all the answers yet but what we do hope that come out that comes out in the heat and building strategy is that we will set the kind of clear long-term path through the 2020s that will set out kind of when key decision points are and how those key decision points might might be made um, so I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so hopefully that was just a, a bit of an insight into the kind of things that we talk about in the strategy. Um, however, there are there are areas that I'm sure we will we'll be exposed to criticism on where we don't go quite far enough and people will be expecting us to go further. And so the things that I've called it my worry list, but I guess um, the way that I think about things, my, my world is very much focused on pre-publication work and then post-publication, what the world looks like after post-publication. And so my worry list are the, th the big things that we, we need to solve post-publication. And we'll be looking to kick off work to, to try to start to unpick and get a better handle on those problems. So the first one, I don't think it'll come as any shock, is the national versus local conversation. So, you know, how do we empower local authorities to do more without compromising fairness, without leading to, as I mentioned before, that kind of patchwork planning? So we need to make sure that local authorities have got all the tools they they need to enable to realise their ambition. But we need to do that in a way that adheres to an overarching national strategy. And the thing that's obviously quite difficult about that at the moment is we know that we are waiting on this 2025 decision point around hydrogen so it's really difficult to um to know how those decisions will be taken and that's an area where we, we have more work to do so that i'm sure that there'll be some people that would like us to go further on that um but we know that, that there's a really big body of work that we it's it's right that we unpick what those issues are before we kind of start setting signals on exactly how that landscape will work. Um, flexibility is a really big issue. Um, we we know that in the in the new world, in the as, as the as the, the decade goes on, we need to make sure that we're incorporating smart not only in our in our kind of 
policies at a kind of individual personal level, but also that we're incorporating it at a whole systems level as well, so that we are minimizing the peak, so that we are, you know, really building in storage as much as we can. And we've, we've really got to grapple with that, as well as thinking about that, not just from a heat perspective, but thinking about how we marry up with all the work that's going on with electric vehicles to make sure that we are working in a kind of coordinated um, coordinated way. We've got to do more work on public engagement. Uh, and in, from my perspective, there's a, there's a, you know, the 10 point plans really set the, set the tone of where the work needs to go. We, we've got a problem that up until yesterday, I think most people didn't, didn't know existed at all. Um, but it's the 10 point plans really kind of hopefully started that dialogue of what the issues are around buildings emissions but we know we've got more work to do there and I say we that's not I don't see that simply as local as national government but I also see that as a job for local government I also see that as a job for industry there's there's a whole host of of engagement that we need to do there consumer protection um it, it's an absolute given that consumer protection is a really key consideration for all of our policies. And so as the policy landscape develops, as we move through the decade, that will be something that's really, really critical. We need to make sure that we are embedding that throughout the policies. And finally, and I alluded to this when I mentioned national and local, um, the long-term strategic decisions, we know we need to do more, more work to unpick that. I'm so sorry, my computer's just frozen. Uh, so I don't know if I cut out there, but, um, long term strategic decisions we've still got more work to do we need to work out what the what the right way of delivering those decisions are in the way that plays in optionality for consumers it also plays in kind of local strengths and expertise um so that's and that's another big area that i think it's possible that people may expect us to go further on but we know that that's the work to do post publication so i'll i'll pause there and then i'll hand back to merlin because i know you you had some questions for me Excellent. Thank you very much, Adrian. And thank you very much for uh, being kind of open with the, the worry list. I think that's kind of, um, uh, it's always kind of useful to get a sense of, of, of that. Um, so looking at the um, at the document, there's a target in there for 600,000 heat pumps a year, which I think was a kind of notable target. Um, and that's compared to about 60,000 heat pump installations a year now and uh, thinking back along the sort of broad sweep of government policy in this area I'm thinking back to um, former chief scientist a good 10-15 years ago who had a sort of vision of 20 million heat pumps and it's been pretty difficult so far it's been pretty it, it's proved slow and it's proved uh, hard so in terms of mechanisms to deliver that I guess that's um, uh, I'm not going to ask you to tell us what's in the heat and building strategy. We have the Green Homes Grant at the moment, which is a mechanism and that's been extended by another year. And we're going to come back to that with um, with Fiona and Emma from uh, responsible for that area in, in Bays. But after that, what, what are the kind of, you know, what sorts of policies might be used, I guess? What are the kind of options you're considering to make, uh, to, to achieve that kind of step change in deployment of of heat pumps as part, I guess, of decarbonising decarbonizing homes? So it's a really good question because obviously the first thing that people jump on when they hear about the heat pump ambition is the Green Homes Grant um, and the timeline for that and what, you know, what happens when the, when the Green Homes Grant comes to an end. But for me, heat pump deployment, it's not just about subsidising, it's not just about providing subsidies in the here and now, although that is obviously a really important part to drive demand. But we need to do things like we we need to build a really credible green finance industry that isn't there yet. So we, we've got a lot more work to do to ensure that for, you know, not just for the next couple of years, but five, 10 years down the line, if people want to improve their homes by buying a heat pump, that they have got some way of doing that. So green finance is going to be really, really important. The other thing that we need to do is, and this is about credible signals for industry, is we hope that that, that, that 600,000 ambition sends very clear signals to, in, to industry about the need to grow their supply chains. And obviously with that will come economies of scale. So we hope that as the, as the technology matures, there will be 
there'll be cost reduction that, that comes just as a kind of natural consequence of that that growth. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the other thing as well, and, and I think again the template plan I really hope is the kind of unlocking of this and starting the dialogue, is there's obviously the 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 strategy will, as I, as I meant, alluded to earlier, will focus on natural trigger points. Um, the issue that we have at the moment is that for the vast majority of people, they don't really know about heat pumps at all. So for me, we need to we need to grow the market. We need industry to do their part. We need to uh, build a, a, a kind of finance system that supports people to do that. But the other thing we need to do, and the really big one for me, is we need to start talking to people about why they need to do it. And I think, you know, the subsidies for people who are less able to pay are a really important part of it but we need to start talking to people that are able to pay to bring them on this journey with us that's a really important component as well so there's a and and, you know the other thing to say and I don't want to give away what is in the what is in the heat and building strategy but we need to make sure all those enablers are there so the kind of the the finance the, the public engagement but as we go through the decade the the regulation will increase in order to make sure that it's not it, it's not a kind of you know either or it's it becomes the the desirable option and we're a long way off that at the moment but as as all those enabling functions kind of grow I think it, I I hope anyway there will be something where it becomes a much more palatable choice whereas right now it's just a an unknown technology for most people okay excellent uh, the, the one mechanism I've uh, used in other areas is a uh, a um, some sort of obligation we've seen renewable transport fuel obligations, we've seen renewable energy obligations. Can we see some sort of green heat obligation as a, as a policy option that might we could sort of make the list? We're not quite there yet in terms of in terms of obligation. The key thing for us right now, because we've still got this big question about hydrogen, is we need to ensure that people that are making the switch to heat pumps, because that's the that's the technology, that's the net zero technology that we've got available right now. Mm-hmm. The people that are making that switch to heat pumps are doing so voluntarily because we don't, what we don't want to start doing is saying, right, everybody in Cornwall, for example, you switch to heat pumps. And then actually in five, six, seven years time, we find out actually heat pumps would have been, is a more expensive option for you. So we really need to capture the fact that it's voluntary right now. Um, and so that, you know, there'll be, there'll be part of the the kind of, public sector leading the way in terms of heat pumps but it's also a big part of that it's going to be people that are able to pay and also the the new build industry it's it's they will have a really significant role to play in terms of growing that market okay a couple of quick um ones then maybe just come back to that in a, in, in a moment but just quick ones there's a eco extension to 2026 that scheme which has been a big part of, of what has actually funded a lot of the energy efficiency measures going on for the you know focused on the fuel poor um it's been a long-term uh i don't know put it lobby campaign pressure suggestion of of distributing that money locally through the local authority rather than just leaving it to suppliers uh who haven't always used it in the most you know strategic way um so that uh, you know, we talk about local that that kind of devolution of some of the funding responsibility for greater coordinated approaches. Uh, you know, is that kind of thing being considered? So it's a really good question, and I think you know, to be really candid with you, um, I'm so sorry, my computer keeps wanting to shut down. And um, to be really candid with you, we we at a high level when we talk about local authorities, we know that there are lots and lots of local authorities that have declared climate emergencies that are able to and have the expertise to go much further than national government is able to right now. And that that's a really, really positive step. You've then got a, a kind of group in the middle that really want to do more, not necessarily got the funding, not necessarily got the expertise, and not necessarily got the the kind of clarity about well, what do we do? What's the right way to drive this forward? And then you've got a, a kind of another group a, you know a very significant a significant minority of local authorities who perhaps don't have the the drive to to pull this agenda forward and so what where we are on in terms of that continuum is at a high level when we talk about what are the barriers to local authorities being able to deliver net zero agenda uh, at a high level people will say well resources money money and expertise that's it um, but the reality is the, the further down in that you dig, there's there's lots of barriers. 
eco being a really, really good example where local authorities are asking for more power. But what we need to do is it would not be the right thing to do right now to just say we will we will hand that responsibility over to local authorities without really understanding what the implications of that would be for everybody in the country. There are some areas where if you did that now, I don't doubt for a moment that that would be a really, really smart move. But I'm equally sure that there are other places where if you did that, it might not it might not have the impact that you would want. So there's a lot of work still to be done on that. Okay. But the understanding on how that would impact everyone is not there yet. OK, I think that, that might be one for us to um, uh, follow up on after, after this conversation. I, I think I'd probably take a slightly different perspective that if we, we need to give devolved powers and responsibilities to localities that, you know, and, and that they will then respond. And it is, you know, I guess there's a slight chicken and egg question there. Um, OK, we, uh, we, you, you raised the, the hydrogen question um, and looking back at the um, 10 point plan, you know, uh, I think paragraph two or something from Boris in one of his usual turns of phrase um, talks about uh, cooking your breakfast on, on hydrogen, which probably then actually in the detail is not really what we're saying in in there, but okay, uh, we'll all uh, understand that politicians need to kind of give good rhetorical <laughs> flour flourish to things, particularly Boris. Um, the, 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 the key, the key, I mean, the, the key, uh, as I read it, we're saying we need to get on with energy efficiency. We need to get on an electrification, particularly off gas grid. Um, and we've got this other potential kind of technology and we need to research and understand that and develop that and see where that takes us. Um, and you talk about, about the safety case being a critical issue in that. I mean, fundamentally from the analysis, sort of analysis we've done, done quite a lot of work in, in thinking in this area, you know, hydrogen is going to be more expensive. I think the commodity gas, a gas is about 1.5p uh, per kilowatt uh, hour and hydrogen, best case that anyone in the industry seems to come up with is about 5 to 7p. Uh, once you've produced it, stored it, transported it, all those those kind of things. So, uh, so that's a very obvious case to use it in in high value applications and in industry and and, and heavy tra goods transport and the like. You know, a bigger a bigger much bigger step to see it become a ubiquitous fuel for heating our our homes. So, has has Bayes kind of really thought through and got to grips with the uh, the, the cost uh, issue there? It's a really good question. And I think there's there's two there's two parts to it. There's the you, you know, you, you you mentioned the the Boris and his cooking his breakfast by hydrogen line, which is one that I personally I really I really love. Um, I think there's we need to do more work with hydrogen because we will need hydrogen for industry. That is an absolute given. So all the money that we spend now is not money that we are wasting it's money that is gonna that is gonna pay dividends for industry in the long term in terms of the how it works for heating there's still a really really big unknown there and i think that there's two benefits there's the there's two there's two issues should i say and there's one really big benefit to hydrogen and the benefit is that it works in the same way as natural gas so in terms of behavior change that what hydrogen may bring as a reality would be that it requires less behavior change um, and that's not insignificant in terms of costs i think it's it's still an ongoing issue but the la the cost landscape is is a really challenging one and we know that we've got to do more work to equalize the cost of gas and electricity first and foremost so i think what the cost of hydrogen will be comparable to electricity comparable to natural gas is it's it's still a moving landscape because there are ways that we there are ways that we have to look at that we can that we can address that cost because what we don't want to do is say everyone switch to hydrogen it's great it's green but now your fuel bills are up by however much they go up by and it's a, so to answer your question no I don't think we've bottomed it out yet I think it's something that we need to we need to do more work on but I also think to the people that say why are we investing in hydrogen we absolutely need to invest in hydrogen because we we need it for industry at the very least. But it protect the potential for kind of reducing that behaviour change required is is a significant advantage as well. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, I could carry on chatting through some of these things for for ages, but we have a, a fantastic panel here to bring a much broader range of, of perspectives to the debate. So let's uh, let's open it up at at, at this point. Um, 
So uh, well, uh, Hannah has kindly brought up a, a, a slide uh, there, which lists out our, our panelists. Um, so I think what we'll do is just just start bringing uh, bringing them in and into into the discussion, um, and ask them all to introduce themselves as they kind of as we bring them in. Um, as you'll see from that slide, uh, sponsors of this uh, session are, T are TLT. So I'm just going to invite Jahanra from TLT to introduce herself and just say hello and kind of welcome from her perspective, and then we'll take it on from there. Jahanra, are you? Uh... Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a construction and engineering projects lawyer. Um, I've around about 20 years of experience. Uh, clean energy is actually um, a real big sector uh, for TLT. Um, we advise kind of local authorities, uh, central government, social housing, private developers. In fact, um, we actually assisted um, Bayes on the uh, the Green Homes Grant as well. Um, although I joined TLT in around about May in the middle of the pandemic, so uh, not something on which I personally advise. So interesting times. Excellent. Jahanra, thank you very much and thank you for your support. Um, I'm going to come next in terms of some of the uh, discuss uh, on some of these kind of policy issues to uh, my colleague Mark from uh, Regen, who's led a lot of our work on the decarbonising heat and used to be a installer himself of these kind of uh, technologies. So um, uh, has worked at the sort of ground level. Uh, we've been doing quite a lot of work in the last year on some number of uh, kind of delivery projects and uh, Regen's a membership organisation. Thank you to all our members for their support. And we've been talking to all our members about uh, Kind of some of the issues here and what their experience is on the ground of, of, of the kind of things we've been talking about with Adrian and the Green Homes Grant and the like. Um, so um, Mark, uh, how do you kind of, you know, we've seen yesterday the, the, the 10 point plan and heard what Adrian has to say, how are you feeling about what the kind of key things that the key kind of things that Regen thinks from its work are going to be required if we're going to meet these kind of targets? Thanks, Merlin, and, and morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, it's welcome in, in many ways. It's, it's a good uh, sort of statement of trajectory, which I think is um, is pleasing to see. Um, I think our our experience on the ground. So, um, as Merlin says, I've got a background of um, being out and installing renewable heating projects. I've also worked on a number of um, Sort of future looking scenarios, heat projects uh, at Regen, um, and being involved in uh, projects looking at um, innovative approaches to whole house retrofit. So we've got quite a lot of links with with the industry and a good flavour of, of of what people are feeling. And I think um, I think it's really welcome. But I think that what we've seen and, and what we've experienced is that uh, the enthusiasm needs to be supported by a sort of long term policy framework that enables. Uh, the supply chain to invest in in delivering these things. Um, so, you know, the extension of the Green Homes Grant for for a year is is a uh, yeah an improvement on the on the very short sort of winter period that we that we ha did have. Um, but it's moving towards that long term trajectory that um, that we need to see um, to allow you know the supply chain and consumers to understand that, that the trajectory that we're on and and get on board with that. I suppose. And once we have that, then that allows uh, manufacturers and developers to uh, improve the solutions, um, to innovate and deliver better products, to deliver better consumer experience. And that's what will then help to bring people along. So I know the, the 10 point plan talks about um, not going against the grain and about bringing people along the way. Um, and, and that's a really a sort of positive stance to take, but we definitely need that that long-term trajectory from policy to allow uh, business and, and supply chains to to develop their products and services to to be able to deliver that and and support that that policy aim. Um, okay, so that that's that kind of message, which I think we've heard kind of loud and clear, isn't it? That that uh, if you're going to invest, if you're going to send your people off on training, etc., you want to know that this isn't a a short-term few months, and then you're 
back to, to business as, as usual, but there's a long-term market that, there that we can get mm-hmm. some, some, some payback. Um, uh, okay, um, thank you, Mark. Um, Richard, let's, let's come to yourself now. Um, I guess the two things we have perhaps seen coming out of the Catapult's work in this, this space. One is that angle of making solutions that are attractive to consumers and presenting and packaging them up and innovating and thinking about that way. Uh, and the second is local planning, local, the role of localities and uh, some of the points that Adrian mentioned in, in there, um, which potentially actually has some tension in here. I mean, you, you can imagine a sort of local plan that says everyone in this area will have heat pumps and everyone over here will have a heat network and everyone here will have hydrogen. But then of course, there's people in their houses and they make their own decisions actually about what they do and what they, what they don't do. So I'm interested in how you see those two kind of uh, you know, us making those two things kind of work together. So some degree of local planning organization of, of how we heat our homes and decarbonize and how we also make this an attractive thing to the able to pay that, that we heard about from Adrian. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I think that they're, they're really sort of important points and obviously something that certainly myself and the team at the Catapult have been thinking quite hard about for a long time, particularly around heat, you know, myself having led the smart systems and heat program for bays and, and currently sort of heading our work on electrification of heat demonstration we i think a lot of the things that adrian sort of grappling with and trying to understand sort of really understand the challenges there i i guess my our sort of hypothesis or view is that a net zero future has the opportunity to be a better future for for consumers and that that's what we should really be driving for it should deliver us better outcomes from the energy that we use it should deliver things quicker quicker faster cheaper it should give us uh, kind of opportunities to do things in a, in a slightly different way and i think um if we kind of track back through history there's lots of examples of how better things have achieved consumer pull you know you look at things like um uh showers uh power showers and and uh, central heating in homes and many other things have, have as much been a function of consumer pull once the infrastructure uh has been kind of put in place to be able to deliver those things so we can see a, a framework whereby national policy and direction connected with local planning coordination and implementation and then ultimately connecting to products and services that have appeal and value to consumers across the value chain can really build the momentum and, and, and create a cohesive framework for delivering uh, net zero outcomes. Um, I think I'm my reflections on some of the experience of the COVID kind of situation and how we've had to create national positions, but ultimately local implementation has been critical and the connection between those is so important to actually delivering outcomes on the ground. And I think there's some interesting lessons for us to learn about how we could create the right sense of policy direction that Mark was talking about. How do we create the certainty that's needed? I mean, a lot of what Mark was saying really chimes with me because I think giving confidence to industry to build the supply chains that are needed to deliver at pace and scale is so important. And and, and what we have to do is join those things up together to get them to work cohesively. Um, The other thing I just say that I I, I think, you know, the 10 point plan is, you know, is, is a great signal of intent, but a lot of what we're seeing in terms of particularly the digital infrastructure that we're going to need to make these things work for people and engage people is really important and it's and, it, and we have to make sure that that isn't forgotten um, a lot of us are buying things engaging with things digitally people are buying cars they're buying all kinds of different things that they wouldn't have done previously through kind of digital uh, kind of interactions as the first portal call and i think there is an opportunity there for the uk to kind of figure some of this stuff out and how we approach this uh, which can kind of lead and demonstrate the way for the rest of the world. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, Mark, the, the theme of uh, local has come up quite a lot there and the, the role of national direction, national framework setting, and then the you know consumer engaging with consumers and then what needs to be done at a local level. Um, GMCA has kind of been one of the leaders in this kind of era. Do you have a clear picture of what you want to see from central government and what you think is right for you guys to be leading on? Yeah, morning, everybody. Um, I think it it does require both. So I I think the whole debate around is it top down or bottom up um, is a bit superfluous because we do need national government to set firm and um, unwavering policy 
to give businesses the confidence to invest, uh, to give innovators the uh, confidence to innovate, and to give customers and consumers the confidence to, to switch, to, to try something different. Um, so I think national policy and, and obviously um, financing of, of these measures is, is really key. I think the, the differential for me, and somebody mentioned it in the chat actually, is that we need to, in my view, stop thinking about energy efficiency and energy generation as two separate things. They are, they are basically two sides of the same coin. And this plays into where the local areas can add some value. Um, the, the local area energy plans that Richard's been speaking about um, give the opportunity for us not just to signal what sort of heating systems might be most appropriate in given areas, but also where the energy generation might come from that might help to support those heating systems if we're talking about fully decentralised networks or even partly decentralised networks. And as some of the work that we've been working with the ESC on starts to, to look at what, what does the business case look like? Um, and it, I think that the, the, the future business case for adoption of different systems will depend upon whether you can bring generation closer to use or demand. And if you can do that and you can reduce the cost of local generation, then I think some of these technologies be become more financially viable and attractive. Um, so that would be my first point. I think my second is around um, working with Bayes directly with, with, and five other cities. We're looking at how we decarbonize the local area broken down by uh, building typology. So Greater Manchester is focusing on social homes at the moment, uh, but there are four other cities working on uh, public buildings, private homes, schools, universities, and health, I think was the other one. And by the end of the year, what we're hoping to do is deliver outline business cases for each of those archetypes that would then be appropriate to be adopted across all of those five cities and then potentially wider. So I think you know, Bayes is showing some leadership in, in this space by looking at how we can both um, encourage local authorities that are geared up and prepared to move further, faster forward, but also making sure that the legacy of that is applicable to everybody so that you have um, added benefit and added value of undertaking this sort of exercise once and adopting it in other local areas once it's been uh, tested elsewhere. And I think that's quite a good model from a from a government funding efficiency point of view. I think that's a good place to be. And then um, finally, I, I think it, what local authorities do really well is engaging with their communities and their supply chains. And I think this is where Green Homes Grant um, is, is potentially quite fruitful. I think the challenges around Green Homes Grant, understandably, given the COVID situation, very much on you know, short term, let's create jobs, let's get let's get the job done. Um, and my only concern is that actually supply chains require greater certainty and greater longevity. And I noticed there's been announcements in the last couple of days about extending some of those schemes. And I think that's really welcome. So joining up this, um, th this area with creating local jobs, I think is something that local authorities and LEPs can support uh, and trying to encourage our of not just our populations, but our businesses to consider alternative methods, particularly for heating, but also for energy generation, is something that we can do in a more coordinated way by bringing people together so that you could do peer-to-peer -peer sharing as, as, as an example, which may uh, create a, a financially viable case where one didn't persist before. So I'll, I'll stop there. And, and I think that it's been a really useful discussion. I think my summary of the 10 point plan it's probably the reflection that other people have given. I think it's a really good start. It creates a frame. It doesn't really put the money where the mouth is, in my view. And I think people recognise that we probably will need to spend a bit more than is currently planned to really create that change and make it happen um, substantially at scale. OK, Mark, uh, thank you very much. And lots of um, uh, key points raised there in the way that we do this, smartness, where, where local uh, government has a key role uh, and you've teed us up nicely on the Green Homes Grant and we're, we're fortunate today in having a, uh, a, a three Bayes representative so many thanks to them for that. We have Emma and Fiona who are working particularly here on the Green Homes Grant. Um, Emma you must have been uh, very pleased to get um, I don't know if it's, uh, an extension of a year and uh, well there's another billion sort of 
loosely in, in, in this area. It wasn't quite clear exactly how much on the Greenhomes grant from, from what I saw. What have you, what's your experience so far of setting up a scheme like this and, 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 and running it um, in a kind of fairly short, you know, in a, under a pretty quick agenda and under a kind of, we need to create some jobs kind of pressure? Um, yeah, th thanks Merlin. It's a good question. I'm here with my um, colleague Fiona as well on the policy side. So I'm uh, the project director for Green Homes Grant Scheme. I work in Bayes um, and it has been unprecedented, the delivery. So the uh, Chancellor made the announcement on the 8th of um, July uh, about the Green Homes Grant Scheme. We had around 12 weeks to get ready for delivery at that stage, choose a supplier and launch the scheme. So it's been a, a very big delivery in Bayes in, in, in the, orga the organisational terms. And we've been building that delivery capacity in Bayes as well, ready to take on the economic stimulus schemes. So um, we've, we've issued around 43,000, um, sorry, we've, we've had applications for around 43,000 um, vouchers at this stage, and that equates to around £309 million pounds worth of work and around 10,000 jobs. So just picking up on the comments that we've had so far, um, we, we are in a COVID situation, second lockdown, so that's had an impact. Um, and we've also had to look at different other factors in relation to the Green Homes Grant Scheme. So the extension by year is, is very uh, supported. That will give us an opportunity to deliver the scheme. And we've also got some funding from the government to go forward into next year as well. So we are looking uh, to see what we can do with the scheme to get as many vouchers out the door as possible and create those jobs and, and carbon efficiency measures as well. So I think experience, I think the experience has been, you know, it's a very big project to deliver in very short timescales. And I think in fairness, we had around five months to deliver 1.5 billion pounds worth of funding scheme and around 600,000 uh, 600, vouchers estimated. We won't be able to deliver the full amount over the shorter period that we've got now, but with the extension, we hope then to have a smoother trajectory through until March 2022. So yeah, just a couple of lines on the uh, delivery in Bayes. Okay, that's uh, that's very helpful to um, to hear and, uh, and understand um, how how that's going. Uh, the topic is, uh, I mean, just on one very kind of practical point. Um, there've been lots of stories, and actually, my my own experience as well of going online and, and being referred to installers in two hundred miles away. I think might have been Newcastle, the nearest one for me, um, it, which you know has perhaps slightly unfortunate rings of certain other government schemes sending you quite a long way away. Uh, how, uh, what's your kind of view of that and how you've been addressing some of that problem, the availability of local local people to deliver some of these projects? Yeah, I mean, I mean Merlin, we're working on the customer journey side to, to make improvements all the time. Obviously, we've had to introduce a scheme in, in rapid time. Mm -hmm. Um, in relation to the Simple Energy Advice website and the location of installers, what we've done is taken the steps to put national installers down now. So I actually, I live in Newcastle myself, actually. And I think initially, if I went to go and look on uh, installers, for example, for loft installation, there would be local installers, but not the national installers. So now that we've changed that, so you can see not only your local installers, but also the national installers. So when I logged on after that change had been made, mm -hmm. I can see around five pages of installers now that would come out to my home in Newcastle. Um, perhaps not the best example loft insulation because there should be more installers for that. But we, we've now included national installers. So you, you will see um, the national installers listed and you can click on those if you want to as well. So there should be a much bigger choice of installers on the Simple Energy website now to choose from. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Fiona, one, one of the critiques of the, the scheme so far has been the um, complexity in the primary secondary measure. I was uh, on the radio yesterday driving to uh, my EV, obviously. Um, <laughs> to, uh, I was uh, I was listening to Martin Lewis, who's uh, expressed a lot of interest. I'm sure you've uh, followed his comments carefully. Uh, and that was his, his um, kind of seemed to be his key point. Let's get rid of this primary secondary measure thing because it's just over, over complicating things. Uh, what, what's your perspective on, on that? And, given the extension scheme, might we see changes? 
Uh, thank you, Merlin. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yes, uh, Fiona Hesketh. And uh, yeah, I've recently joined uh, this area to pick up the Green Homes Grant policy lead. Um, and yeah, I mean, the primary secondary split was delib a deliberate choice uh, when the scheme was designed in the summer to focus this on the higher carbon saving measures. Um, and you know, all of the conversations so far in terms of supporting uh, the supply chain, you know, low carbon heat and insulation, those are the areas that we need to be growing in order to meet the challenge of upgrading our homes to EPCC. Um, so that was a deliberate choice. Um, now, there has been feedback, which is obviously very useful. We've got these sort of early stages of demand and supply coming through as the scheme is starting to st stand up and, 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 and start to roll. Um, the scheme, you know, is being reviewed in light of that. And um, it, there's not a lot more I can say, unfortunately, in terms of where that might end up. We are looking at it, I think, is 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 it's fair to say. And we take take the challenge that that may be a bit complicated, uh, but we just need to balance that off with, um, you know, value for money, carbon saving. Um, and, um, you know, I don't think anyone particularly wants this to become, you know, a double glazing scheme. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, excellent. Uh, Fiona, no, that, that, that's very clear um, as to where we're at. Um, uh, you know, if, uh, and I, probably Martin Lewis is the most effective lobbyist in the country after after um, Marcus Rashford, maybe. So uh, once he's on the case, I suspect there'll be quite a lot of pressure. But just pick uh, one other issue. I'm not sure whether Fiona or Emma, you, you for, but specifically on the Green Homes Grant uh, and Mark's point about you know, support for the supply chain. So. Um, Regen's actually got a lot of experience where we've been running schemes that are developing you know, a much smaller scale market pool, uh, creating, you know, we, we have a, a scheme of 15 whole house energy retrofits in, in Exeter. And alongside that, we've usually run some sort of business support program for installers, and that's usually included grants for, um, uh, for people to do training and the like. So Mark personally supported, was it 100 local installers in, in Devon? Uh, uh, Mark, along, along, and that you know, a, a tremendous response and support, and uh, and help helping that sector. So, um, could we, you know, what, what's the feeling about trying to line up some of these demand schemes with supply side uh, support as well to enc encourage local installers to uh, develop the skills and be able to meet the demand. Uh, I'm happy to respond to that one, uh, Merlin. Um, yes, indeed. I mean, the the uh, the challenge, as is as, as has been raised in the chat, of getting enough installers certified to pass 2030, and recognising that pass 2035 is on the horizon, is 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 a big one. Um, so we've put in place a uh, up. up to 7 million uh, this year to support skills development um, across the kind of work packages that um, the Green Homes Grant covers um, to try to, uh, you know, address that very point. Uh, we, we're stimulating demand, but, but what are we doing to, to support supply? Um, and I think the extension of the Green Homes Grant is a major opportunity, actually, for the supply chain to respond, you know, um, and, you know, the regulatory framework that will come on stream come mid 2020s in relation to private sector rented standards, uh, the mortgage lenders consultation that's also was announced yesterday, uh, the future building standard will start to kind of turn the screw in terms of mandating energy efficiency. And so we would hope that, you know, in, in the year, two years of, of pump priming, um, we, we get to a place where demand then is sufficiently stimulated by the regulatory framework and, and we get to a uh, that long that longer term view but 
you know, it's it, it's a fair challenge, and it's one we've we're grappling with sort of on a day to day, on a day to day basis. You know, the BSI, for example, we negotiated a a 50% reduction on the um, PAS uh, suite of documents, for example, just to try to smooth the, the way a little bit, certainly for uh, for for SMEs. Um, Excellent. Okay, so um, I, Mark, I'm going to come back to you there for a, you know perhaps say and up until recently you were supporting 100 local installer businesses before that you spent your life being an installer so you know just channel for us the the installer community many of whom are being very eloquent on the chat function and their their perspective have they recovered from the trauma of the investing a whole bunch of money on the green deal green uh, and then you know that scheme really being a bit of a uh, a damp squib are, are they uh, you know do they see the world like fiona saying that th this is now happening you know these are this is the future and, and you know we need to make start making that investment in our skills and businesses um i think that uh probably in short mostly no uh but you know there's a lot of enthusiasm there and we we worked with a lot of a lot of businesses um and a lot of architects interestingly who were really, really keen, but um, you know, generally couldn't couldn't convince clients that this was a good idea, and it was always that that way around. You know, the conversation being led by, you know, tr trying to convince the client that this is probably a good thing. So, so we have, you know, a base of businesses who think that we should be doing energy efficiency and low carbon heat, and they're trying to persuade the customers. Um, and what we need is a situation where it's the other way around. Um, and but yeah, we, we, we still don't have that. Um, and a lot of the SME builders who were stung with the past 2030 um, already have plenty of other competent person schemes that they have to jump through and frameworks to get onto. Um, and many of those will view it. I think that the extension of a year will have maybe brought a couple back into the fold, but there's um, there's a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of paperwork to get through as, as an SME. And, and that's who most of us turn to, actually. So, you know, the sort of Bayes research shows that um, if, if we're going to replace our heating system, we'll, we'll turn to our heating engineer. And most uh, heating installation companies, I think 80 or 90% of them are less than four people. Um, and most of us would turn to our local builder. And most of those building firms are pretty small as well. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> At the moment, I think it's still a bit of a challenging landscape, but we could we need to see that tide turning where customers are asking for this rather than it, um, being pushed upon them by enthusiastic professionals. Uh, Mark, I just there's a little nuance in that, which I think sometimes you know sometimes these conversations, I, I, uh, perhaps we're a little bit guilty of um, uh, underestimating maybe talking to the, the skill base and the, the cap capability and enthusiasm out there, and I think you've made the point there are. 150,000 odd gas engineers who could relatively easily retrain to, yeah. to, to deliver heat pumps uh, and the like. So, so I think what you're telling us is that there isn't a, a lack of enthusiasm, expertise out there in the, in, in the industry. Uh, there's just people making you know, commercial decisions based on what they see in front of them. And, and, uh, and they're not making the commercial decisions we'd all quite like them to make it, but it's not because they're uneducated, stupid, unskilled, it's because the commercial decisions just don't add up for them at the moment. Yeah, yeah but, you know, it's a, a really skilled supply chain of builders and heating engineers who are all busy doing their job and no one's asking for them to do it differently. Um, so why, why would they, you know, a lot of the, the viewpoint is, well, yeah, I'd love to do that, but I'd have to invest a lot of time and a lot of money to get the certification and no one's actually asking me to do it. People just want me to build a normal extension. Or people mm -hmm. just want a gas boiler. So that's that's kind of that. There's a, there's that enthusiasm there, and it can be unlocked, but um, it needs that that pull that, that Richard talked about, and and it's something that we need to crack. And we, you know, double glazing has been mentioned a few times, and that's one of my pet favourite examples, because um, double glazing takes a hundred years to pay for itself in terms of bill savings, but eighty or ninety percent of our homes have it now, because um, it makes it quieter, it makes it more comfortable, um, it, and it um, it raises the value of our property. And so all of those external factors have been captured, and those are the sort of things that we need to capture to get that consumer pull to get us in the right direction. And that's 
whilst I'm on my platform. Uh, I, I think one of the dangers of, um, one of the issues that, that gas has caused is that gas is cheap and easy to deliver a lot of power very quickly. And that allows us to have pretty poor quality buildings. We've got quite inefficient buildings and drafty buildings in the UK. That kind of masks that like a bit of a big plaster, but it's actually doing us all a bit of a disservice by dissuading us from investing in energy efficiency, which would make us more comfortable, happier in our homes, better health, avoid fuel poverty. So there's that danger there that, um, that we're sort of, yeah, masking that with, uh, with an easy solution and that we might be kicking the can down the road a little bit with, um, with energy efficiency measures um, and find ourselves in 2030, you know, having a, an even bigger hill to climb. Okay. I'll stop uh, that. Thank you, Mark, they're very eloquent. Uh, Richard, uh, Mark's given us a quite eloquent you know, perspective of the, uh, the importance of people wanting this stuff and making it their lives better and not being, you know, it's not imposed on them as, you know, you're not, they're not, try, you're not trying to drag people's gas boilers out of their, you know, out of their homes against their, their will. Uh, I know that the, the Catapult has had this, uh, has had a kind of panel of people that's testing out different solutions on and, uh, and the like. How, how do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd, I'd echo kind of a lot of what Mark said. I think what I think is interesting, though, I think I, I don't think people actually like their gas boilers. I think people just don't care. People, they work, they're cheap, they're easy to replace. They don't care what it is. You you need to find the zero carbon equivalent to that. And and there are lots of things that are rubbish about gas boilers. I know, Mark, you know, you know you might, there, there are things that are good, but they're also, they're, they are... They can be noisy. They take up quite a lot of space uh, in certain contexts. A lot of them still are you know, have tanks in the loft, and uh, some of them are in quite awkward places for people. Um, they they can lead to problems with damp, and they can lead to problems with how your your kind of heating is used and dispersed within your home um, in terms of how comfortable you can get. So they are not perfect. And in other sectors, what people do is they identify those problems, and they they solve them. And I think what I would, you know, what we at the Catapult have always been an advocate about is, well, how can you create the policy, regulatory environment and incentives that drives industry to solve those problems, to come up with solutions that are better for people? That And, and people, I don't think, you know, a lot of our consumer research, people won't tell you that they want these. It's like asking people in the 1970s whether they wanted Facebook. It's just like, well, the answer is they're not going to say yes. They're not going to say they want, you know. So, so how can we create the environment that creates and gives businesses the incentives to come up with these, the better ways of doing things. Like, you know, sort of, I advocate a lot of what, what Mark is saying. In, in, in our lab environment, the interesting thing that we've been finding is um, how actually when, once people are exposed to certain things, they start to behave differently, give them better control in their home, and they start to, you know, use their heating differently. They start to give information back to their heating system in a slightly different way, give them a service proposition rather than a product and they interact with that in a different way. Their expectations are different there. Um, uh, and, and, and thinking about what people, you know, actually kind of drives them and, the, and their behaviours. I mean, the, the, the double glazing example, I think, is a fantastic one. And I, I think the, the interesting thing I count with what Mark was saying is a lot of that is driven by aesthetics and status. In reality, people want a house to look nicer. They are buying windows because they don't like brown. They like white. They, they want a sort of ornate feature. So it has nothing to do with efficiency or, or comfort in many cases. It's as much about them wanting something to look nice. And, and how do we encapsulate that in our net zero solutions? How do we, how do we create a pull? Um, uh, I was having a really interesting conversation last week about why, why for fitted wardrobes and blinds at home do we have design visits? But for, for my, my smart heating system, I have... A, a, you know, for want of a better word, a, a plumber rock up, scratch his head and specify one thing rather than in effect take me through a, a journey a, 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 and, and try and convince me to buy things and integrate with things. I, I think there is a huge opportunity there to, to kind of approach the whole problem in a slightly different way. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox a little bit on that. So, I know <laughs> we've got plenty of people getting on soapboxes, which is exactly what this session is, is here for, of course. Um, uh, I do, uh, it's, we've we've covered double glazing, covered blinds, and just Mark, I just want to take us back up at a level. I mean, you're sitting there as a local authority, you set some pretty stretching net zero targets, um, and you're thinking, you know, how, how am I going to get there? And you're looking at all the houses in Greater Manchester and thinking, you know, 
boy, there's a hell of a lot of work to do there. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, as director of environment for GMCA, do you, how confident are you feeling that that from kind of conversation that you know that this kind of transformation that you can bring uh, as the local authority, you know, as the local leadership, you can bring people along on this journey. Gosh, that's a really good question, and I think my um, optimism, probably like everybody else on this call, varies from day to day. Um, I think what I'm, I'm advocating is data is king, um, and we are doing a, a complete stock analysis of the 1.1 million homes in Greater Manchester, partly with funding from LGA. Thank you, LGA. Um, but it's not just looking at comfort and um, and health and safety and quality as a normal stock condition survey would. It's also looking at what would take it to make these homes as carbon neutral as we can get. Um, and that work will come to a conclusion probably towards Christmas time. But what it will give us at the end is almost a building by building estimation of what sort of measures each property and each typology uh, might require to get us towards carbon neutral. And um, for those of you who are deep retrofit um, junkies, it, it doesn't advocate deep retrofit. It, what it basically says at the moment is for quite a number of the properties, they require a reasonable amount of energy efficiency insulation retrofit. But actually to get near to zero carbon or carbon neutral, having PV on homes that have the ability to take it and some form of heat pump that are interconnected gets you pretty close to carbon neutral with a reasonable level of insulation. Now, that, that's what the research currently says. What it, what it doesn't take into account is where the energy is going to come from and whether we've got capacity in the grid and all of that needs to come later. But what's helpful in that scenario is it gives us um, reasonable understanding of where to target initiatives. So the Green Homes Grant Local Authority Delivery Scheme we're delivering at the moment is we're focusing very much on those properties that are being identified out of that research. Um, and it helps us to at least try to encourage people to take advantage of the opportunities that are available to them and potentially tries to sell it to them in a way which makes sense to them. So I think okay. that's one thing we can do. Um, I think that some of the, the points in the chat I personally would agree with. So that the personal rather than a um, the organization I work for might well not agree. But um, I did see 10 years ago when, when we had a, um, a gate fee escalator for landfill, um, I saw that create a change in the waste industry, quite a substantial change in the waste industry. And it wasn't that the gate fee was jumping up hugely each year. It was the fact that businesses who knew that they were going to have to pay a fee and that, that fee was going to increase year on year on year were incentivized to make a change to their business model. And I think something in this space would also um, be, be quite useful. If there was a, a government signal around the way that energy prices are likely to go, uh, some form of escalator, which would have to be offset by a, a de-escalator to, to encourage the right behaviours potentially, then I, I could see that being a, an interesting policy vehicle. And I do think that nudge would work in that space. So it wouldn't need to be a huge increase. It would need to be a signal that, the, that this is the direction of change and that direction is going to be, uh, is going to march on. And that, that will open up an awful lot of um, opportunity, I think, for businesses to invest. But also, it, it will start putting, um, you know, ideas into house buyers' minds. Well, actually, if my energy price is going to go up in that space, maybe the EPC rating is is quite important, and it might be one of the factors that I really consider when I buy. And when you start getting into that sort of mindset, then it puts an emphasis on people who are trying to sell their property to make sure it's as energy efficient as possible before they sell it. And so you create this circle of activity, which plays into what Rich was saying about what. Well, you need to understand what will create change mm -hmm. and to incentivize it. Okay, it plays a bit to um, uh, Regen's paper on the decarbonisation, decarbonising heat, which Mark is a uh, lead author of, to has a, a marble run, which I think came from Mark playing with his young kids <laughs> uh, with the idea of trying to get things on a, you know, rather than pushing water uphill, it sort of comes down. So uh, 
Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting analogy that plays to come some things you're saying there. Um, I think we might take a quick go here at bringing in some of the wisdom of the crowds. We have 200 odd uh, people out there. So we had a poll set up with the wonders of Zoom technology, which um, asked a fairly simplistic question about the most impactful uh, kind of measure. What was the key measure if we can hit that kind of 600,000 heat pump type target? Um, so I'm hoping that uh, Hannah can bring that up for us. Um, one slight problem about Zoom functionality is it's uh, you can't sort of vote for different ones or put percentages or, or like, so it's a fairly, what would you choose as the most important measure? So if you want to say all of the above, then um, uh, that, uh, I understand, but sorry, we're going to force you to make a choice. Uh, so this will uh, uh, hopefully feed into Adrian's uh, heat and building strategy, Tell, give her the answer as the most important measure. Sorry, could you just repeat that for me? I was busy reading the reading the the chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hopefully that's very useful for you. I was just uh, saying, Adrian, that that the um, this poll is especially for you to just to give you the answer to your uh, questions about the most important policy measure uh, for yourself. So, um, uh, Hannah, do you want to give us the results? And um... okay, there we go. We have a st strong strong winner. That we need some sort of incentive mechanism to re replace the green home grant. So I guess that's saying that we don't think we're going to be at a point where uh, after after this, where um, uh, you know, where we're in that self-sustaining and uh, kind of uh, positive marble run, where this will all just hand over to the private sector, and a way perhaps we might begin to think we're closer to in power and transport in heat that we're, we're going to need some clear mechanisms from government. Um, I'm going to pick up actually on the second uh, runner in that, the 22% of people talking about the levies. And that, that's another thing in our, that we put in our paper on decarbonising heat. And I'm going to come back to you, Adrian, having uh, again, again tear you away from all those fascinating comments on the chat. Uh, and the, the, that's a fairly obvious point, isn't it? That if electricity is becoming something that we're encouraging people to use for heating and it's currently all of the uh, levies that we've been using to pay for decarbonisation are on the electricity bill and pretty much nothing on the on the gas bill um, and that just feels like it's not really going to work if we're actually if we're asking people to switch away from gas to electricity we're putting a bunch of costs on their electricity bill uh, yeah, that feels like our incentives aren't all perhaps uh, uh, aligned. Uh, now, obviously, uh, Treasury, um, uh, ha, you know, I, I know that it's not good for one's career to start uh, suggesting what Treasury has is should do or could do or, or might do or won't do. But uh, you know, is that something kind of understood and accepted in government? Yeah, and it's I'm, I'm really glad you raised it because it's one of those things that it has been talked about publicly as an issue, I say publicly, I mean in industry obviously, as a really big barrier that needs to change. And although there's been a there's been an understanding of this needs to change, I don't necessarily think that we've been in a position to or have have looked at addressing it seriously up until now. But the really internally in base, the really positive thing is that that workstream it, it really feels to me that that workstream is picking up now. And is being tackled seriously, whereas previously it had just been something we'd said, oh, we need to do something about this. So whilst externally it might not look, you know, externally there aren't the signals there to the industry to say, don't worry, this is in hand, but internally it feels like that landscape is changing and it feels like there's some, there's some kind of big policy boards and big brains on it now, which I think previously it was a, it was a kick it down the line problem. But I, I think we are at the point now where that that line is finally here and we're addressing it so I think that's a really it's a really positive step we're not there yet and it's it's a complex problem I, I've, I've been when I've been reading my chat I can see that there's lots of people that are talking about taxing the wealthy to pay for the poor we need to make sure that you know any any levies or any taxes that we bring in are not regressive we need to make sure that we are the people that are using the 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 gas are paying for it, it so it's a complex landscape we don't have the answers but I feel very confident now that we are looking at it seriously, which is a nice position to be in. 
Okay. Um, okay. When, uh, looking through the, um, the the ten point plan, the the full uh, color version with the pretty pictures and things uh, that came out towards the end of yesterday, there's a there's a ses uh, a page that says look ahead, page thirty five, I think, for those who uh, are interested, and it sets out a, a um, well, I guess a fairly encouraging but also probably quite daunting from officials point of view series of energy white papers transport decarbonization plans heat and building strategies industrial decarbonization strategy hydrogen strategy net zero strategy infrastructure strategy uh and hmt net zero review um is is this within the kind of a the treasury net zero review agenda or do you see it as kind of within the heat and building strategy i kind of thing just to so we all kind of know what, what's sitting where I think it's in both. Um, I think the, the work stream is being kicked off by the AE. So we, it's, it, I mean, I say, just to be really clear, it's in a very, very nascent stage at the moment. It's, so although Bayes are kind of saying, right, let's get this off the ground, Treasury are working with us and are really closely involved. So a, as it grows, I'm sure that it's going to become a bigger problem and it'll, as these things always do, drag in more bodies from mm -hmm. across government. Mm -hmm. But that's what that's almost what you want to happen because then you're getting the the right lens is looking at it. So the, 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 there is join up, although as I say, it's at that nascent stage. So I think it, as and when it falls out, it'll sit somewhere between Treasury and, and Bayes in all likelihood. Okay. Um, a couple of other issues that came, back, came up that I thought good to come back to yourself on. We haven't talked a lot about new homes. I mean, there's always lots of figures about 80% of the homes already here or whatever it is it is now. Um, but equally, it doesn't make a lot of sense to build new homes now that contribute to the problem rather than part of the solution. Um, this hasn't been a particularly happy history in the last decade or so of government policy of, of, of standards that have come and gone. But we now have the sort of pledge of the future home standard um, and the 10 point plan discussed that being uh, 2023 as a target date. Um, and we had the announcement before from the Chancellor that uh, that would include no new no gas boilers, no new gas boilers. And I think that might've been a 2025 date before. So looking through this, it seems like that date has been brought forward to 2023. Um, uh, are we interpreting that right? Or is there still some lack of clarity in that? I think there's 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 definitely the will. There's, um, I think it's still in discussion. So I wouldn't want to say definitively this is, this is what the date is going to be. Um, so it is still, it's still a little bit opaque, but the, the will is certainly there. But I'm I'm really glad that you that you brought up new bills. I can see there's a lot of lot of questions about new bills in the chat, and some somebody said, could we could we not just tackle new bills and we don't need to worry about retrofitting? We we need to target every single building where possible in the UK. There's not a single building that we can we can just say, well, they're kind of off limits for now. We need to, we need to tackle the whole swathe, and that includes new builds. And the, the quicker we're at a point where build, buildings being erected are net zero ready and don't need to be retrofitted, the better that landscape will be. Um, OK, uh, that one angle just in there just to mention that we've been pushing for is some local authorities. I don't know if GMCAs amongst this have been looking to set tougher standards than government policy and government's been there's been some discussion with government not keen to allow that, you know, to patchwork of different standards. So that's another kind of local national point there in terms of development standards for, for new properties so that that's another thing we've been pushing for is that those local authorities that do want to go further should be allowed to do so um okay we're, we're coming towards the end of our time let me come back around the the panel uh Johanna I haven't uh, brought you in for a little while I mean you you've um you're working quite a lot with the industry and you've been listening I think to, to all everyone's been saying about the kind of measures and the centers Are you, do you see uh, you know, uh, I think it'd be fair to say that if I was in certain sectors of the economy, the power sector, the transport sector, you know, I would now recognise net zero as probably the critical strategic issue for me or, you know, or even in the oil industry or something like that. I'm not sure that I could have said that about the built environment in the past. Um, could you say it now or is it still like it's an issue, it's a topic, but we're kind of waiting till government really tells us this is this is something we really have to take seriously. I think my clients definitely are looking at it, uh, without a doubt. Uh, I mean, just picking up one of the points in terms of retrofit, I mean, I can say just as a consumer, um, I think one of the problems in terms of uh, trying to change 
just anything in your house is the fear factor um, of it going wrong. So you you try your best to choose the appropriate installer. Um, everyone hears about things saying they've got a 17th century property and it was the wrong measures that were put in and then next thing you know they've got damp. Um, that That is always going to be the problem for a consumer, um, I think, and, and, and making sure that there is that they have chosen the right person. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of new properties, it is a lot easier, uh, definitely. Um, quite a few of my clients and, um, are going into modular housing. Um, and in terms of modular housing, I think, in fact, one of my clients uh, did, the, uh, did, did some new properties at uh, Wigan Pier, um, and they put heat, heat source um, you know, pumps in as standard. Um, following the planning permissions, looking at uh, green energy is obviously vitally important. Again, what you want to do is future-proof. Um, so it could be that your planning says, well, let's, let's put in, I don't know, three electrical charge points, but you want to future-proof it so that you can try and consider further uh, connection points. Um, the other thing, I think Mark Atherton, I think uh, you raised the interesting point about, well, Let's, let's consider in terms of lowering energy cost, because what, what people don't want is it, you, you know, to increase their costs. Um, I think one of the things that I think Hackney Council did was that they set up an energy services company. So they looked at buying uh, energy for uh, far greater households and then selling it on at a cheaper basis. So there are ways, um, you know, in terms of doing that. I think the big thing is always going to be cost for any kind of developer, local authority. It always is going to be. I mean, there's a lot of grants out there, ignoring the green home grants for retrofit. But um, the experience, as you say, in terms of using those grants, a lot of those work on concession agreements, similar to the old PFI model. So... I mean, there's, there's so many things to kind of consider. Um, there, there's so many impacts. I know it's quite at the forefront and a lot of on my client side, um, mainly because it, it is kind of one of the ways making sure that grants are conditioned in terms of green energy. Um, that's a big way, of course, people are then going to consider it. That, that's how you get your money, how you change, start changing the market. Okay, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, let, we've just got a few minutes left, so let's have a very brief final comment, um, just come around the panel. Uh, Richard, last point, um, and maybe you might just mention SMART. Um, we, we haven't talked a lot about that, uh, get in, in the whole area of you know, the overall SMART energy system. Mark's brought it up a little bit in locating supply and demand more, more, more closely, and uh, we all know if we need a lot more uh, heat pumps and EVs, we're going to need a smarter system, and move stuff away from from peak but um so uh, perhaps a final comment and if you might just just kind of uh, point us in the direction of of the, the issues around of, of how we can get towards a smarter system as well yeah i mean I, th I think that's the one that i think it builds on some of the comments in the chat i think we see that uh, almost the underpinning building block for the solutions net zero solutions fundamentally we should be looking to ensure they're smart that means smart generation smart storage smart networks and ultimately smart homes I think some of the challenges that were outlined in the chat around things like how do you make a heat pump work you know, with this situation or it doesn't quite, you know, we can't do this because of this. What we found is that the kind of the ability to control energy and use energy in places and in homes is the foundational building block that allows you to tailor and develop solutions, whatever the mix of technologies are. And also, I think equally, it's the underpinning for developing integrated technology solutions, which is what we think ultimately the future is likely to need. We'll need a combination of energy efficiency, heat pump, boiler, can, you know, uh, distribution, storage technologies at different levels. Um, uh, and, and really, if we get that right, it can provide us the foundation for not only being able to roll out and deploy at pace and scale, but also the optionality around how we might need to change tack. I mean, uh, some of the things Adrian was referring to about, we're not quite sure yet. You know, we, we're never gonna have, we're never gonna have 100% certainty on a lot of these things. So we're gonna have to try and create the way in which people can move forward and things can happen while still retaining some optionality for change, recognising that lots of stuff is going to change. Lovely. Thank you, Richard. Final comment, Mark? So I think that 
what we haven't really discussed is the scale of the issue and i think it's because a lot of the people on this chat are already aware of it but the the quantum of change that's required over a fairly short period of time is quite extraordinary therefore pilot schemes whilst great to prove innovative processes or to prove that something works is a fine and they're needed um, but we've got quite a lot of them already what we really need are incentives that are going to encourage more people to change what they're currently doing with heating or their homes at, on mass and i think this for me boils down to three things we talked about most of them so if you can make it cheaper or come up with a financial mechanism that will spread the cost and make it appear cheaper if you can make it easier and i quite like the idea of having an intermediary who can um, provide you with advice and support on what's good for your home and then quality assure the work afterwards i, I do i'm a big fan of the of the retrofit coordinator model uh, for those people probably in the able to pay market and the third one is is make it sexier and i think that's where richard's just started to touch the whole smart home thing with Google and Alexa and everything else, it, it's in everybody's homes. That's happened in the last few years. And we're, we're constantly now thinking of new ways to integrate smart living into the way we live our lives. Why not extend that into how we run our homes and run our buildings? So I think that's a really good way forward. And it's something that people will adopt because not necessarily because it's cheaper, not necessarily because it's easy, because technically it's not, but because it's it's sexier, you know, you have the ability to control your home in a way that other people don't, and it's a bit of one upmanship, and that will appeal to a certain section of the market as well. So cheaper, easier, sexy. Okay, so a bit more eco bling is the uh, uh, is the. <laughs> oh, <that's horrible. laughs> um, uh, okay, uh, Emma, very quickly, and you've heard a lot from you know different perspectives about what what's um, about how people are seeing things, what, what they need. You're trying to run a very specific grant, trying to make it as impactful in, in the short term. What any any final conclusions on on the how the green home grant might have make an impact in the next year? Yeah, I think I think on a on a wider point, Merlin, there's been some fantastic ideas, and it's been really good to hear the kind of policy and design ideas. I think we we need to focus in the next year uh, taking the kind of policy ideas into delivery. So what you'll see in the next year is the delivery of the Green Homes Grant Scheme. There'll be a significant number of vouchers will go out the door. It will create the jobs. It will create the carbon. But I think the lesson learned is just having that time to de design the scheme and then implement it. We've we've implemented it within a you know unprecedented time scale, twelve weeks. So I uh, hopefully the next twelve months that we have will give us a an opportunity to go on a much smoother trajectory but it will reap the benefits um, and hopefully it'll be the green fields for the start of much bigger greener uh, projects that are delivered in the future and we're building that capacity and base to do that. Excellent okay I think that probably tees you up Adrian for a, a final a word um, uh, as to kind of what, what you've heard from today and what you'll take away in, in thinking about the heat and building strategy. I might just ask <laughs> one thought that's come up a bit about the chat on back on the hydrogen question and whether 2025 is a sort of realistic point for us to uh try and make sort of make a big strategic decision between uh hydrogen and electricity and whether you know whether that's actually going to take a bit how that that process might actually work but as i say more generally what would be interesting to know what you've taken away from today as you as you try and finalize the strategy and maybe you might want us to tell us a, a, a publication date as well <laughs> I did wonder if I was going to get away without revealing that. Um, so publication date, we would like to have it follow the, the energy white paper as as soon as possible. Um, but there's a lot of things that happen before the energy white paper that might might hold things up. And if there's a delay with the energy white paper, it's likely we will be delayed. So I think I'd lo love to say this year, we're still on target for this year, but it's, it's possible that it might move till January now. Um, so I think, yeah, managing expectations on that. And I think in terms of hydrogen, we, that, we know that there's going to be uncertainty until that point. So the things that I would take away, and I, I can see that there's lots of people that have really flagged this. And I really like Julian, Julian Boss's idea of a retrofit show home in every street. The things that for me are the really important takeaways is we can't, while there is this uncertainty, that doesn't mean that we can do nothing. The things that we need to be doing are talking to as many people as we can and engaging as many people as we get we can about the needs to make their homes more energy efficient and the need to to if that involves retrofit so be it but we 
we need to start having that conversation now and bringing the public on the journey with us. Excellent. OK, well, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, and just, I think, made for me to uh, bring things to a uh, close. Um, apologies, everyone, my uh, chairing failure that we're four minutes now over time. So, um, uh, yeah, I shall learn, try and manage things slightly more carefully. But we've had carried about 200 participants to us right to the end. So uh, clearly we haven't bored people too much talking about uh, decarbonising homes and uh, I I guess the, um, the the scale of the challenge and, and, and Mark's point there at the end, just reminding us what a big challenge and scale that the, this really is, is uh, kind of um, yeah, explains the level of interest in this agenda um, and the level of opportunity. And, and, and that's a point perhaps to finish on in terms of you know, smarter homes, better homes, more comfortable homes uh, and more jobs, more skills development in, in our supply chains at uh, this time. So uh, let, let's try and finish that on that optimistic note. Um, thank you very much to everyone for participating, for all uh, 250 odd of you for, for participating, for your very active contribution in, in the uh, chat section. Um, I should, of course, uh, finish reminding people that Regen is a membership organisation of companies, organisations that kind of work with us to uh, as part uh, jointly on our mission to um, transform the energy system for a zero carbon future. So anyone who'd like to uh, get involved and work with us on that journey, it's something we obviously can't do alone. We uh, love working with others on, on that, in partnership with others on that, then um, please do let us know and get in contact. Um, and so thanks very much for all for your participation. And of course, Thanks very much to our speakers for their time and expert uh, contributions. It's uh, uh, a lot of them are very busy trying to deliver on some of this, so it's been fascinating to, to hear from them. Our, our next sessions, I think you've got up on the slide, uh, as I said, net, uh, sort of quite an agenda in November, net zero November. Uh, so we've got sessions on investment specifically, and then we've got our green recovery leaders debate uh, on the 26th of November, where we perhaps have all taken, had a bit of time to take stock of the 10 point plan and think about whether we really are on track for a green recovery and really getting on track for, for net zero. And that starts with an interview with Declan, who's director of clean electricity at Bayes. And then we have a great panel uh, to discuss then. So yeah, plenty of plenty coming up. Once again, thank you all for coming. And uh, as I always say uh, at the end of these sessions, my I used to wish you all the safe journey home and now it's just uh, wish you a safe journey to your kitchens for a well-earned cup of tea. Thank you everyone.